you or you're not going to make it. It's a commitment. It's not a feeling. You got to come home when you're in love and you got to come home when you're not in love or you're not going to make it and stay there till the love comes back. It's a commitment. Y'all don't want to hear real truth. You want to hear fairy tale Hollywood shake and bake stuff, but in reality, it's a commitment.
Amen. Amen. God is good tonight. Amen. Brother Jonathan, who is that? That was Eddie James. Eddie James, man. That song was jamming, man. I was back here worshiping to it. I was trying to wait for it to, to go off. That song's pretty long, huh? <laughs> Amen. That's good. Okay, I, I sound a little a little funny. Maybe a little more more highs in the in the vocals and a little bit in the monitors if I can get that. Alright, well I want to thank everybody. Okay, that's better. Amen. Thank everybody for coming out tonight. A couple of announcements. Our event that we had scheduled tonight was canceled. Heaven's little angel, she couldn't make it out to Vegas due to some unforeseen circumstances. But she said that she wants to reschedule. So please keep her in prayer. She's got some things going on. But the show must go on, right? So I want to refer everyone to our second Saturday. July 8th is our next event. Our club his hop event. Uh, we have some artists traveling from out of state. So we definitely want to show them some Las Vegas love. Um, one of the artists, his name is, uh, his last name is Dangerfield. And I, I talked to him, I said, man, you know, that's a famous name. You know, Rodney Dangerfield. Who remembers Rodney Dangerfield, right? <laughs> no respect. And that's actually his real name. That's his family name. And so I'm excited to, to meet him and to allow him to share his ministry with us here in Vegas. So please let everyone know. Bring your family, your friends come out and fellowship and today it's a little warm today in the in the warehouse in the club I am talking to the building owner I believe that the air that this blower is blowing out is warm so we're gonna try to get him to correct that for us so bear with us tonight it's not gonna be this hot all the time we have cold water in the refrigerator if anybody needs any cold water right there in our refrigerator. As a matter of fact, I might ask Pastor Randy to pass me a cold water because I forgot to grab one like usual, right? I'm always forgetting. Thank you, brother. He's got the ice over there going. And plus, we have some cool down stations over here. Go ahead and get in, uh, stand in front of those fans. Those fans will cool you right down to where it's not unbearable heat. It's hot, but it's not unbearable. But you go in front of those cooling stations, you will be blessed with some nice ice cold air blowing on you. And we're going to battle through these Sunday nights. We don't care whether rain, sleet, or snow. We're going to preach the Word of God. We're going to tell people about Jesus Christ. We've had some a couple of new families the last couple of services. I'm excited about that. Amen. God is good. And right now, you know, we don't have any more announcements other than uh, July 8th. Go ahead and throw it, brother. I know we got we got these fences here. You know, this is this seat. I wanted to make sure that there's a separation between the pastor and the congregation, right? So that's why we set up fences. I'm just joking, y'all. I'm just joking. <laughs> now, um, we just had the event and the last promoter um, who rented the space. He put these up. He's going to come back tomorrow. And hopefully Brother Randy will be available to meet him tomorrow. I'll whoop. Amen. All right, uh, Super J, she's going to give you her key. Just, get, just make sure you give it back to her. Okay, thank you, brother. All right. Well, that I believe that's... Oh, you got the announcements going? Let's see, did I throw something up there that should be announced? I know that it sounds a little windy. We got our fans going up in here. Okay. Well, tonight I want to talk about the Bible study a little bit. I believe that this message is timely for the day that we are living in. 
I believe that we need to restore the structure in the church. And what I mean by that, the church in some ways has a bad rap. You know that there's been pastors who have stole money from the community, the congregation. There's been pastors, they've molested children and molested people and there's been pastors that have had a side relationship other than their wives and a lot of things has happened. There's been a lot of men that were put on pedestals and evangelists back in the 60s and 70s and they failed to prostitutes and different things like that. And a lot of people were hurt and a lot of people turned away from the church. And now the pastors that are trying to be faithful and they're struggling in their ministry, sometimes we get the fallout of what's been going on in the church world. People think they can come into a church or a ministry and they can tell the pastor what to do, look at the pastor up and down, and people think that they can just kind of do what they want. But you know, the church was Jesus' idea. It's an institution that God placed on the planet Earth. And I think that there's, in some ways, we need to repair it. Now, the Bible tells us that there's going to be some evil birds in the church. So yes, there are false teachers, false prophets, false brethren and sisters. There are people out there, they're in ministry just so that they can hurt the cause of Christ. And then they can give the church a bad name. But also God will always have a remnant. You know what I mean by that? God will always have his faithful people, no matter how small, on this earth doing his work. And God's church is still here today, fighting with the sword of the Spirit, faithful in serving God in all this. And so what I would like to do is I would like to set up the structure and the understanding in our ministry. Because I still believe God has called this ministry to affect the whole city. And I also believe that God has called us to a national platform where we're going to be in every city preaching the name of Jesus Christ. Whether it be through music, media, TV, whatever it may be. And so for such a large calling as that, of course we're going to come under attack, right? But if we are set on a solid foundation, if we are running like we're supposed to run, how many of you believe that the church is actually an army, right? Awu, right? We are actually an army. There's ranks. There's commanding officers. There's different duties that are assigned. And we have to stay focused on the task. We have to treat this as a military campaign because we do have an enemy out there spiritual forces, spiritual wickedness in high places and they are arrayed against us and they want to stop everything that we are doing. But God has also given us weapons and he has prepared us for this battle so we can be victorious and so that we can go forward. So today I'm changing it up a little bit. You know we're supposed to be in the book of Revelations tonight but this message was heavy on my heart. We need to restore the church or restore the structure, restore the order in the church. So if you follow me tonight, I have a few scriptures we're going to go through, flip around in tonight as we go before the Lord in prayer. And also our offering bucket is in the back. If uh, Feel free to drop something in there if you're led to. So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, and we thank you, Father, for the opportunity to look into your word. Even though this might be a battle or a war, you've given us the instructions, you've given us the playbook, you've given us a strategy book to where if we follow it, we will be victorious every time. 
And Father, you said in your word that if you are for us, who can be against us? So we thank you tonight. We pray, Father, for your spirit and your grace to fall in the service tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, and God's people said, Amen. All right, I'm trying to find a spot where the, the fans are not hitting my mic so hard, but I don't know if I can find one. All right, so tonight we're going to take a look at godly leadership. Godly leadership. You see, the church has taken so many blows that people think that they don't need a pastor or they don't even need a church to worship God. They don't need a pastor or a leader or a church to serve God or to fulfill the call of God that is in their heart. And I want to say this. That is halfway true. That is halfway true because there are pastors out there and I was actually involved in a ministry where the pastor told the people that if you wanted to get to God, if you wanted to find an answer or if you wanted to find God's will for your life, you need to come to me because I'm, the, I'm your shepherd, I'm your pastor. You come to me if you're looking to work a job or something, come to me and then I will find God's will for your life. I'll find out for you. Well, the Bible tells us there is no mediator, mediator between God and man except the man Christ Jesus. Some pastors overstep their authority. They want you to submit to them in absolute lordship as if they have the same authority as Jesus Christ has in your life. That's overstepping the bounds. Peter tells us that godly leadership, we are to be examples. We are not to, supposed to draw disciples to ourselves we're supposed to point them to Jesus but we also will tell them follow me as I follow Christ but if I stop following Christ don't follow me anymore follow Christ yourself amen but some people they have absolute loyalty blind loyalty to a leader blind loyalty to a personality when our loyalty should belong to Jesus Christ and Him alone. But of course, we are to honor His people and honor His leaders. And so in, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, we're going to look at God's attitude of heart towards the leaders in the church. And He tells them, Starting in verse 17, obey those. Is there a way you can flip that? I know when I put it up there, I had it in. There you go. Is that the new King James? Yeah, it is, huh? It says, I beseech you, therefore. No, that's the Amplified. That's good. Okay, I'll read the scripture and then, I'll, then we'll take a look at it in the Amplified. In verse 17 it says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief for that would not be profitable to you. Let's see what it says in Amplified. Obey your spiritual leaders and submit to them continually recognizing their authority over you. For they are continuously keeping watch over your souls and guarding your spiritual war warfare as men who will give an account. Right? So that right there will probably cause a few people to drop their jaws, right? Cause a few people to, to stumble back a little bit. Like, what? What? I got to... Submit to my spiritual leader? I'm supposed to obey my pastor, my spiritual leader, my youth group leader, my outreach leader, whatever type of leadership it may be? Yes, that's what God expects you to do. He tells you to obey those who have the rule over you. 
in the New King James rule. So that means your spiritual leader have some authority in the ministry to make some decisions and to make a few calls of course within God's will and as long as it's within the parameters of the scriptures yes they do and it says to submit to them now it also says that they keep watch over your souls now some people might be scratching their heads you know there's people I've talked to and people I have interacted with in ministry and sometimes they look me up and down and they're like who are you you know who are you people don't need you people don't need you to serve God people don't need to be in your ministry to do what God wants you to do but they don't realize that the role of a spiritual leader our job is to keep watch over their souls and they're like you know what I'm gonna watch over my own soul I don't need you to keep watch over my soul who are you you ain't Jesus you ain't nobody but you know what we all have blind spots God charged the leaders to watch over the souls of the people that they're ministering to. But a lot of people reject that authority. They reject that decision or that function. And I want to say this. There are some ministries you could join. Some pastors, they look to take advantage of their people. They want their people to constantly work for them, cut their lawn, cut their grass, da da, da do whatever. But do they take time out to watch over your soul? Do they take time out to sit down and ask you, how are you doing? How are you living? Have you been tempted today? What are you being tempted with? What is Satan tempting? You know, we all get tempted. It doesn't matter if it's a leader or someone, you know, just barely saved. I don't care if it's Billy Graham. We all go through temptation. We all need a brother or sister or somebody mature to kind of help us walk through so Satan won't take us out. Amen? We all need that. Does he sit down and does he talk about your attitude? Does he talk about your decisions with you? Not to control you, but he is overseeing your soul. Maybe there's some anger or some bitterness creeping, creeping in there. Maybe there's something in there. God has anointed him and given him eyes to see into your soul to help you work these things out. Now, Jesus himself, he gave the church leaders. Of course, we know Jesus died on the cross and he's at the right hand of the Father. And I've had people tell me, they tell me, you know what, I don't need to go to you. I'm going to go to God. I'm going to listen to God. God's going to tell me what to do. You, what, what are you going to tell me what to do? I'm going to God. But you know what? God has given leaders to the body of Christ. That's how he gets things done. You know, do you think God needs to use angels to answer prayer? You know, when you ask God for something and God wants to answer a prayer, he's going to dispatch an angel to answer that prayer? What are you going to say? Say, you know what? I don't want this angel. I want God. Forget this angel. God going to answer my prayer. But God is going to answer your prayer through that angel. And God uses his people. If we go to Ephesians chapter 4, 10 and 11, it tells you that he who descended, which is who? Who descended from heaven? Amen. Jesus is also the one who ascended, went back up to heaven, far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some, now this is Jesus, he gave, what did he give? He gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastor teachers. Amen? Jesus Christ put the leadership in place. This is how he wants to run his kingdom on earth. They were given directly. So if you're saying that, you know what, I don't want my pastor teacher to affect my life, my spiritual life with God, then you're rejecting God's order. God put that pastor in, in, in place to help you 
benefit spiritually. Now, as I was thinking about this, and and I've been engaged, I've been engaged in a couple of conversations, and and you know the attitude really in the Christian world. You know, they feel like they can go out and do what they want. They don't need a pastor. They don't even need a church. And I'm asking God, you know, why do people need leaders? Why do we need leaders? If we have you, why are there leaders in the church? Why do people have to have a pastor? And, and why are people trying to, 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 you know, counsel us and instruct us and get involved with us to kind of help us? And then God gave me Isaiah 53, 6. If you get that scripture, it says, All, we are all like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Amen. Because we have all gone astray like sheep. The Bible tells us that we are like sheep. Do you know the characteristics of sheep? Sheep are dumb. I'm sorry. Sheep are dumb. Sheep, they do not fight or protect their own territory. They do not run from predators. As a matter of fact, if you look it up on the internet, if you look it up in the news, it's been reported that sheep are known to walk off a cliff. They will follow one sheep, right? He'll be the leader sheep. And the only reason why he's a leader sheep is because he was the first one to move, right? He was the first one to move around. And so, okay, all right, they're going to follow this sheep. And this sheep going to go fall off a cliff. And there was one newspaper reported 400 sheep fell off the cliff and died. 400. You think maybe one or two of them would have said, hey, you know what? I see a lot of blood down there. I don't think this is a good idea. No, they all fell off the cliff. And most sheep, they need a shepherd. They need someone to guide them and to lead them into green pastures so that they can eat and be refreshed. And when they get lost, the shepherd needs to go out and find them. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself refers to himself as the good shepherd. Amen? And Jesus said in Matthew 9, 36, if you can get that one, Matthew 9, 36, Jesus refers to us as sheep himself. He says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Like sheep having no shepherd. And so some of us, we get so proud and puffed up. I don't need a leader. I don't need a shepherd. I don't need a pastor. You're going to go out there and get eaten up by wolves. Amen. You are not able to take on Satan and his kingdom all by yourself. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care if you look like Arnold, right? Or who's the, the new guy today? Is it The Rock? The Rock is the big guy today, Rock. I don't care if you look like The Rock. You're a weakling compared to, the, to Satan. Amen. You need God's kingdom. You need God's people, God's leaders. You need to be to find your place in God's army. Now, as I was thinking about this, I'm like, you know what? God doesn't refer to us as, as lions, you know. All like lions have gone astray. You know what I mean? A fierce lion could go out and rip somebody to shreds, right? He doesn't refer to us as a tiger or a bear, you know. Now he says that we're like sheep. And he should know, amen. So because we are like sheep and we allow our own hearts sometimes to deceive us. Now, if you think that you can just do what you want and there's no ramifications to that you can rebel against godly authority 
Well, look at in Romans chapter 13, verse 1. God tells us we're supposed to obey the law of the land. We're supp supposed to obey our government. We're supposed to obey our police officers. It says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. God set up every authority that we know. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. You know, God appointed our president. God appointed our police officers. God appointed leaders in the church. And when you rebel against these authorities, you're rebelling against God. Now, I know that this could be a sensitive subject. I know a lot of people, they don't like Trump in office. So this is not a political message here, you know. I don't want to get our tax-exempt status revoked by the government, right? They're probably listening to us now since I said that. So now this is not a political statement, and I do understand that police officers, they can be aggressive, and a lot of innocent people died under their care. And I know that God has a system in place to punish those. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite characters in the Bible... King David, he was anointed to be king because Saul, the first king of Israel, would not listen or obey the word of God. And so what does God do? God knows how to handle his leaders. God tells Saul, you can no longer be king. Your family is not going to inherit the throne. As a matter of fact, I'm going to push you to the side and I'm going to have somebody better than you who has a heart after my own heart take your place. So God knows what's going on with these leaders. Now, if David would have came in there and said, you know what? God doesn't want you, Joker. I'm going to take you out. I'm going to take the throne. Da-da-da-da. I don't know. Saul was pretty bad. He might have taken David out before he was able to get as strong as he was. And of course, you know, Saul was a bad leader. He was a bad leader. He tried to kill and murder David. David had to flee to the hills and to the mountains to get away from him. And one time, Saul was sleeping. He was in a cave somewhere, sleeping, and David sneaks up and cuts off a piece of his clothing. He could have taken him out. He could have plunged a knife right into his heart and said, it's over. The kingdom is mine. But God would not allow him to do that. David says, you know what? I'm not going to lift my hand against the Lord's anointed. Now here is a fallen godly leader, a backslidden king. But David still honored him because God has placed his hand on this man. God has anointed this man at one point of time. And David says, you know what? I know something about God. God can take care of him. You'll either die in battle or God will remove him. But I am not going to lift my hand against him. And see, God says the same thing about his leaders in church today. It's not up to us to go and say, you know what? I'm going to handle this. I'm going to take matters in my own hands. And I'm going to just give them a piece of my mind because we need every piece we got. Amen. God forbid it be the last piece, you know what I'm saying? You have no mind left. But, but people, they want to take things in their own hands when God says no. There's a way to do that. Allow God to deal with those leaders or come with Scripture prayerfully. If you want to show your pastor or somebody something, my point is this, don't take it lightly. It's not a light thing when you come against God's leaders. Don't be quick to say that this person is a false this or this is a person is a false teacher or your ministry is not valid. Make sure you're not speaking out of the side of your neck because God takes that personally. There might be some things you don't understand. There might be some things that God is working out in his life, but if you coming against them, puts you in jeopardy, but at the same time, if you pray for your leaders, right? God calls us to pray for our leaders. 
you pray and you bring everything that you see, everything you see could be true and valid. But if you go about it the wrong way, you've made the situation worse. Whatever you see, bring it before God. God can handle his leaders. He doesn't need our help. And so and here is a, a sign of a false teacher, a false brother or sister, a false prophet, or even a wolf that wants to come into the church and devour the sheep. One characteristic that you will always find is that they all despise authority. They'll come against authority, they'll hate it, they'll try to gather people to themselves, they'll come against the movement of the ministry. And if we turn to 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 10, 2 Peter 2 verse 10, we'll get a little insight on this. And it says, especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority, they are presumptuous, self-willed, they are, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord, but those like natural brute, those like natural brute beast. Wow, that's a tongue twister. To be caught and destroyed, speak evil of things they do not understand, and will utterly perish in their own corruption. Amen. So we have to be careful about this. We have to be very careful. And it breaks my heart because I know the word. And I know sometimes I have a word for a person. I know what they're dealing with. I know what they're struggling with. And I got the answer. And I know all we have to do, you know, if I share this scripture, if I share this and we pray on it, I know that this can help this person if they take it to heart. But you know, there's some people I can't even share the word with. There's some people I can't even correct. If you go to um, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8. Proverbs 9, verse 8. The Bible tells us not to even try to correct a fool. Amen? Or a scoffer. It says, do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. You see, you try to correct a scoffer or a foolish person. You try to speak to them and help them. They'll hate that. They'll, they'll resent that. And the Bible says, don't even do it. Hopefully that person will either learn by experience, if that person even learns at all. Proverbs 12, 1. Proverbs 12, 1 tells us, whoever loves instruction, see, that's what we do on Sunday nights. When we come together, we come together, we get instruction from the Word of God. Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Now, how many of you like to be called stupid tonight? Nobody, right? As a matter of fact, that word stupid just might be fighting words for some people. You know what I mean? They're ready to get it down. They're like, what? You call me stupid? But think about it. This is God's word. God is calling you stupid. That's God calling. I don't think you can, you can uh, go to blows with God, amen? God says that if you hate instruction and knowledge, you're just, you don't want to be corrected, you're just stupid. Because God places people in your life to protect you and to help you. Proverbs 18, 1 and 2. And I've had people tell me straight up, I don't need you to come to your church to serve God. I don't need to be in your ministry. I don't need to come to Bible study. I don't need nobody. I can just do it in my own. I'm going to go up to Mount Charleston and it's me and God. Amen. Right? The Bible nowhere. If you search the Bible, the Bible does not have anything good to say about people who isolate themselves. 
Look up isolation in the Bible and see what God has to say about it. In this scripture, Proverbs 18, 1 and 2, it says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. Amen? The Bible doesn't give you kudos for being a, to, to iso, when you isolate yourself. The Bible doesn't say, Blessed art thou, you long ranger Christian who never got nobody saved and never loved on anybody. I mean, I know that it's hard sometimes dealing with people. You know, this is the people business. We have to be patient, we have to be loving. People are going to rub us the wrong way. They're going to let us down. They're going to tell us they're going to do something and don't show up. And they're going to commit to things and don't follow through. But it doesn't mean we say, you know what, forget it. I'm taking my ball and I'm running. I ain't dealing with the church no more. I ain't dealing with nobody. I'm just going to be my, to myself. I'm going to read the Bible and pray. I'm going to go find me a hotel room and I deal with nobody ever in life. God doesn't say that we would be blessed if we do that. Now, we also have to understand that people, the church is not a museum for the righteous, it's a, a hospital for the wounded, amen? And People are going to have the wrong attitude, they're going to have the wrong mindset, and they're going to be involved in things that are just straight out sin, forbidden in the scriptures. And people will try to tell you, you know, they'll say, you know what, we all do a sin, we all sin. And if you say you ain't a sin, you a liar, because the Bible says so. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, so who are you to try to tell somebody not to sin? When we're all sinners. How many of you have heard that? Amen. Well, they use that as an excuse to continue in sin. Of course, God tells everyone, come as you are, but he doesn't say, stay that way, right? In Romans chapter 6, 1 through 12, the Bible gives us instruction on this about sinning in the church what sh shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound verse 2 certainly not so we shouldn't continue in sin certainly not how shall we who die to sin live any longer in it or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized unto Christ Jesus were baptized unto his death so, you know, when we get water baptized, we're symbolizing the death of Christ. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead, and when you come out of the water, you're symbolizing the resurrection of Christ, that now you are a new creation. By the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. See, now, when we're baptized, we are identified with the death of Christ. We come up, we come up raised as a new creation. And we are expected, God expects us to walk in the newness of life. We are expected to walk in the, in the spirit. We are expected to walk in obedience to God. So does that mean that we are sinless and we're perfect there's no such thing as sinless perfection on this side of eternity. We are always going to be dealing with sin, true. But there's a difference between that and between rebellion against God and refusing to submit to his authority and practicing sin. You see, the difference is this. A Christian, he'll be walking along, minding his own business, then all of a sudden, bam, he will fall into sin. But here's the thing. He will not be comfortable in it. He will not make a home in it. He will not be like, oh, this is great. 
a Christian will feel horrible. They'll be convicted by the Holy Spirit. They will not be able to enjoy that sin like they used to. And then they can't wait to get to church so they can get it right, so they can repent. They can't wait to talk to their pastor, to confess, and to get clean, and to get their mind and heart right. But a sinner, an unbeliever, is a person, is not, they're not walking along minding their business. This is what they're aiming for. This is what they intend to do. How many times at work have you heard people say, you know what, this weekend I'm going to go out and do this. And this weekend I'm going to go out and do that. I'm going to go get this girl, I'm going to get high, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. That's what they're aiming for. And this is something that they practice. They're practicing this. They're getting good at it. When you practice something, you want to get better and better. You want to improve in it. A person, look up in the Bible, look, look up when the Bible mentions practicing sin. Those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So are we practicing it? Is this a habitual habit in our life? Or is this, is this a Christian who's just having a struggle in their life, getting stronger, and eventually they'll get the victory over it, and they'll move on to the next struggle? Because we're going to continuously struggle until we get to heaven, but we should be getting better. We're not sinless, but we should be sinning less. Amen? Now, the reason why... When I had to think about this, you know, I, I see people... Especially in this ministry, a lot of people, they want to um, get up here. They want to produce music. They want to be producers. They want to be artists. And there's a lot of artists, you know. Of course, you don't have to be here to be an artist. I'm not saying that. You don't have to be a part of this movement and this ministry to go out and perform and do songs and things like that. But make no mistake, when you join this ministry... We are a ministry that deals with sin. I mean, we are here to oversee your soul. We care about your walk with God. We care about if you make it to heaven or not. We don't just want your talent and your gifts. You know what I mean? We're not just a record label. We just want to make some money off your music. No. But the problem is, is when people want to bring their sin up in here and still do their music... They want to throw their sin all around this place and be like, okay, accept it, ignore it, and let me get up here and get on the mic. And like I said, there's a difference between going through the process of you're trying to get over this sin, that's fine, we're not going to condemn you. But if you're just blatantly, you know what, I'm just going to live with my girl, I'm not going to marry her, we're sleeping, we're doing this outside of marriage, yeah, we're going we're gonna to have to deal with that. We're going to have to walk through that. We're going to have to address that. Because what you do for God, if you're living in sin, doesn't count anyway. God isn't blessed by that. The Bible says sin will always separate you from your relationship with God. There's scriptures all over the Bible. There's people who say, Lord, Lord, have I not, not done many wonderful works in your name? Have I, not, have I not cast out devils? Now, beloved, I have not cast out one devil yet in my ministry. And I thank God for that. I'll probably run for the hills if I saw somebody demon-possessed. Amen. Now, I know God's grace will be there to help me if that ever happened. But this dude did miracles, did wonderful things in God's name. And then Jesus says... Depart from me, you who work iniquity. I never knew you. So being in ministry doesn't validate your walk with Christ. But the reason why people don't deal with these things is because at one point in time, they've been hurt. And I can understand that. I have been hurt. I have been hurt by a pastor, actually a group of pastors. I have been hurt by a fellowship I've been hurt by a congregation and some of the things that they have done to me in the past I still deal with today and I still have to struggle with it I still have to forgive them and lay it down but some of us are still hurt maybe a pastor did something years ago and you're upset with all pastors 
I don't want no pastor to say nothing to me. Or maybe a church hurts you. I ain't going to church ever again. But what we do by not forgiving, we make ourselves our own prisoners. We build a prison for ourselves. The way for you to get free is to forgive those. Once you forgive a person, they no longer have power over you. They no longer owe you anything. When you hold on to unforgiveness, you feel like they owe you something and you just can't move on in life until they pay up what they owe you. You're stuck. And a lot of people get trapped. I was trapped for years behind my bitterness. And I finally let God have his way in my heart. And if you go to Psalms 147 verse 3, the Bible tells us that he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. What has hurt you tonight? What has hurt you today that has got you stuck? You see, when we're hurt, we begin to justify our sin. Well, that person did that to me, so I have a right to go blow their head off. Amen? I have a right to be angry and upset. I have a right to do what I want to do. I ain't going to no church. I ain't listening to no pastor. You know, we feel like we have a right. And see, beloved, what happens is a stronghold begins to form in our minds. You know what a stronghold is, right? Military term, stronghold is a fortified fortress or a place that you have held that is not easily taken over.